After testifying before Congress and making front page news with the Sunnyside case, Grace returned to New York and once again threw herself into the strange and unusual cases that somehow always found their way to her desk. She fought against the same doctor who tormented the famous reporter Nellie Bly when she went undercover at an insane asylum and was marked for death by the sinister Black Hand, the Italian crime organization that used secret codes and mystical rituals. Eventually, one of Grace's rich society friends, Mrs. Felix Adler, called to tell her that a girl had gone missing in New York and begged her to meet with the father of the girl, one Mr. Henry Kruger. By the time Grace agreed to take the case, Ruth Kruger's photo had appeared in newspapers all over the country. Her image even flickered in front of movie theater audiences. The press, drawn to the story of a pretty Sunday school teacher who had vanished, openly suspected white slavery, foul play, and romantic entanglement, sometimes all in the same story. Juicy clues were flooding the detective precincts but none of them panned out. But Grace took a different approach to the case. She locked herself in her office for a week to study every scrap of paper related to it. Grace had been trained as a lawyer, but her inability to trust the police or even the law itself had, over the last few years, turned her into more of a detective. Now, at age 48, her formula was to search for clues herself, verify them, and use them in the courtroom to make her arguments. She didn't trust the police, so she effectively just found her own evidence. In this case, Grace kept coming back to Alfredo Cochi, the man who had sharpened Ruth's skates. Since being questioned by detectives, Cochi had also disappeared. Though most of his neighbors speculated, he simply feared being made a scapegoat for the crime, especially because he was Italian. The police, it seemed, could blame his people for anything in those days. Um, and it's true at this time, the, everyone blamed um, the Italians. If anything was, was criminally related, they would just blame the Italians. Um, but though Cochi's place had already been searched, his motorcycle shop was the last place Ruth had been seen. Grace wanted to see it herself. This is how Grace ended up standing in the middle of Manhattan Avenue in Harlem and staring up at the Metropolitan Motorcycle Shop in June of 1917. Grace craned her neck and took in the tall glass windows that ran almost 10 feet high across the front of the store. The white lettering across the glass read, Motorcycle Storing on the left and Auto Supplies on the right. She saw tin signs for mobile oil that hung still in the air. A single globe lamp hung off a pole in front of the entrance, and a huge billboard for graham crackers, as big as long as the shop itself, rose off the roof and into the blue sky. The inside of Kochi's shop was dim behind the smoked glass. Maria Kochi, Alfredo's wife, had been left behind and, and was now when her husband disappeared, and was now desperately trying to keep the store afloat. She had two small children. Maria, who claimed to have no knowledge of where her husband was, had refused any further searching of the premises. The police were no help either. As Grace moved from desk to desk in city buildings, trying to gain entrance to the store, to the store police officials smiled and said their hands were tied. Grace was limited to what she could see from the outside. There were two signs in the window that read mechanics help wanted and selling out. On the outside, to the left of the front door was a narrow stairwell that sank into the ground and served as a separate entrance to the basement. Grace walked near these stairs as unobtrusively as possible. Grace knew, like it or not, that all of her misgivings about Kochi and his store were all circumstantial. The police had searched the cellar twice and found nothing but absence. The rest was gossip and headlines. Why was Kochi missing? Because he had taken the girl? Because he had been spirited away by the same fiends who had taken poor Ruth? Or was he just terrified of being blamed by proximity? Perhaps there were more sinister forces at work, such as the rumored white slavery ring 
that stretched all the way down to Brazil? Or was this the work of the black hand? There were even rumors that Kochi had been very friendly with the motorcycle cops in his neighborhood. Grace knew that those questions might be the most dangerous ones, but they still had to be asked. Grace paused, considering the options at play in her mind, intersecting like the city itself, still struggling to connect its new boroughs into one unified whole. Perhaps Ruth and Kochi were the happy couple in this after all. That version of the truth seemed remote, but still. Grace went back to her office, thinking through the heat, trying to come up with a plan. When she got to her office, she called her good friend, the private detective named Julius J. Crone. Crone was a federal agent when he was first assigned to Grace during her US District Attorney days. Um, and Grace, one of the, the things I found out, she was the first female U.S. District Attorney. Um, this is, I think, a major historical point, um, and you have to look really, 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 really hard to find it anywhere. <laughs> um, it's a major accomplishment. 